Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zach Lofman. I realized I was going to be talking to such a packed house. I'm glad to see you all here this afternoon. Hopefully you're not in a, too much of a food coma. Uh, I am a staff SRE at Google. I've been working on GKE for about a decade now. Um, and here I'm going to talk to you about better pod availability. This is a pretty nebulous topic. Um, but we're going to go over several ways to manage workload disruptions, many of which are familiar to you, some of which may be new. So what is pod disruption? Anything that interrupts a pod before the application exits can be considered disruption. Now, that's a super nebulous, uh, that's a super nebulous definition. There are so many things that are actually in this envelope. And in fact, the Kubernetes documentation even has uh, a taxonomy of these, splitting it up into involuntary and voluntary disruption. Um, by the way, I have uploaded these slides to SCED. So if uh, you see me putting links in here, uh, you can follow those, or you can just take pictures. Uh, most of these things are Googleable pretty quickly. Um, so let's go through these in just broad terms. I loosely categorize these on the, the left, uh, which is where the Kubernetes documentation calls them involuntary disruptions, into things like <laughs> halt and catch fire events. Uh, they are hardware failure, uh, OS failure, network failure, anything that just stops your pod suddenly. Um, Another thing in that involuntary category is, out of, is also out of resource evictions, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. In the voluntary category, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, are various app owner disruptions. So you have a rollout, you delete the deployment, you restart the de deployment, et cetera. And in the middle, there's an interesting category that's voluntary, but it really depends on your provider as to how voluntary it is. Uh, that includes cluster administrative actions. So this is anything that incurs a node drain, so evicted by upgrade, scale down, node repair. And we're actually going to spend a chunk of time talking about this category. So that's categorizing it into voluntary and involuntary, and a lot of that has to do with um, how the pod, uh, how all of the Kubernetes machinery reacts uh, to that particular disruptor. But we can also talk about, is this good disruption or bad disruption? Now, this is, of course, a qualitative definition. But anything that's uh, the pod is interrupted when you want it to be interrupted is good disruption. Most of you are wanting wor workloads that are infinitely running, right? Um, and so you can't not have disruption. So a lot of disruption is good disruption by our very broad definition of anything that causes the application to exit. Bad disruption. Any time the pod is interrupted unexpectedly by, by your own uh, definitions, that's bad disruption. So now we can start to look at that previous taxonomy again, and we can start to describe kind of best practices around uh, these disruptors. For any of this broad, like, halt and catch fire category, it's mostly driven, it's mostly bad disruption, and it's mostly driven by hardware and software quality. Um, you've had this one hammered into you, I am sure, but your best practice here is to design for failure. Uh, there is, you know, we could talk about uh, making sure you get quality so hardware and software and keeping patches up to date and yada yada. That's a whole other talk. Uh, there are ways Kubernetes can actually help you here. Um, there are things like anti-affinity and topology spread constraints to make sure that you actually keep pods um, apart on nodes, on replicated applications, or apart within availability zones, again. On the other end of the spectrum is the kind of application owner disruptor, disruption. This is, I'll, I'll say, mostly good disruption. M config changes in Kubernetes, mostly good. <laughs> Obviously, and this is the other part that uh, has probably been hammered into you over the years, the best practice here is things like robust change management. So 
you know, most of you here are probably practicing some form of GetOps. That is a form of robust change management, especially with proper review, et cetera. Uh, there are other practices like we employ internally, like uh, multi-party authorization for manual changes. So if you ever have to go slightly off of your uh, off of your existing patterns, making sure that you at least have someone looking over the shoulder. Um, I'm going to just, there's actually multiple ways that Kubernetes can help here. I'm going to talk about a, a, one big one here. Uh, I'll also mention that, that things like the deployment rollout strategy are a great example for uh, ways you can limit disruption during cluster administrative actions. Um, but one big one that I'll mention uh, uh, is pod disruption budget, uh, because it actually interacts a lot with uh, some of the topics we talk about later. So drilling in on, uh, on PDB, I'm sure that most of you are, f how many of you are familiar with PDBs? Okay, good. <laughs> I'd be a little disturbed if not. Um, but PDB specifies a disruption limit. So you can have at most one pod down, two must be available, 80% must be available, et cetera. Um, in general, PDBs are meant to help protect replicated apps. Uh, and they can be used on any scaled resource. Um, so it, uh, they are honored by most of the voluntary disruptors, uh, and in general, most of the disruptors. Um, the one case of where it's a little bit best effort is actually the, on the next slide, which is the out of resource evictions. Uh, if you aren't using PDBs, you should be. So if you aren't familiar with the topic, go, you should probably go research. So now we're kind of moving into the middle of this taxonomy. Um, out of resource evictions are interesting. Uh, the Kubernetes taxonomy puts them in the involuntary camp, and they are because you have to make decisions quickly on this. Um, they aren't necessarily involuntary though. Uh, you might voluntarily configure your cluster for these. Um, again, this is a broad topic. Uh, in fact, I think there was even a breakout this morning talking about how to, about evictions and uh, tuning requests and limits. Um, so here you have to decide where your trade-offs are. Uh, for example, if you're tuning for utmost reliability for a specific pod, you're probably gonna want to avoid oversubscribing your nodes uh, which means your requests are equal to your limits around. So, uh, but in general, people like oversubscribing their nodes and it depends on the, the workload, et cetera. Um, so if you're tuning for cost, you're gonna be looking at things like pod priority. Um, resource evictions are one of the cases where PDB is only, off, is only honored on a best effort basis. And in particular, when a node is running hot and has to evict something um, immediately, uh, that's a case where PDB just isn't really honored at all. So now kind of whittling into the middle uh, is this class of cluster administrative actions. So it's uh, node drains in particular. Um, most of these are uh, actually driven by automation these days. Um, actually, I'm curious, how many of you regularly take nodes out of service on your own, like manually use a cube control drain? Okay, not a ton, but <laughs> there you go. So, right, most of these actions are covered by automation these days, uh, in particular, uh, cluster autoscaler, um, upgrades, and uh, things like node repair. And I'm actually gonna focus here for the rest of the talk because this was a, a surprising area where there was a, a lot of divergence uh, between providers uh, and, and implementations. Um, and so now I'm gonna talk about a particular case study. So I came at this while working on a framework called Agones. Uh, is anyone familiar with the good news? All right, cool, we have a few hands. Um, 
Agonia is, is a framework for running uh, dedicated game servers in the cloud. For those of you who aren't familiar, the idea behind this is, uh, you know, you and I want to play a FIFA match. Uh, so uh, uh, games, we both connect to the same pod in the cloud, and that's what's uh, I'm trying to indicate here by these controllers connecting to a pod. And the, that pod runs a simulation of the game state. Now, game servers are an interesting case study in disruption on Kubernetes. So the problem here is that actually each pod is a game session with its own in-memory state, its own basically simulation of the state of the game. And these can run as, as uh, thin as a very lightweight simulation of uh, you know, particular players, uh, you know, placement, et cetera, to all the way to I'm going to render a bunch of stuff uh, and then pipeline that out, kind of similar to how like Stadia or other like uh, games in cloud would go. Um, and they all have direct player connections, like straight to that pod. Uh, there's a few exceptions to that as well. A single game session can last from minutes, mobile games, et cetera, to hours, um, and uh, even even longer in the case of uh, companies that are running like MMOs on game servers, which we saw plenty of as well. Um, there are cost and complexity trade-offs and literally like game development trade-offs to implementing any sort of reasonable like checkpoint restart for game servers. Uh, and an example of what I mean there is uh, if any of you um, have played a, a popular MMOs, you might have seen uh, a little inner shtetl pop up saying, hey, the number of players on this particular server is getting low. Uh, you know, here's a reward to migrate off this server. That's actually an example of a company that's, uh, that's implemented a, a form of disruption control in order to scale down their game server. Uh, a lot of times they still give you something like an hour um, to get off the server. Uh, so this actually presents a unique challenge in the Kubernetes landscape because of the, most of the Kubernetes workloads are actually not intended for just running forever. Um, bad pod disruption on game servers basically just means game over, like you lost, lost your connection to the game server, um, re results in a reputation loss for the company itself, and you know, at scale, this can result in real money losses for uh, the game company as well. If you run training jobs or HPC workloads, uh, this concept may be familiar as well. Um, anytime you disrupt a uh, training job that's on you know, thousands of dollars per hour GPUs, uh, you typically are gonna be paying a fair amount of money to recover that state uh, because there's a lot of times not robust checkpoint restore. So as a trade-off for these pods that can't fail, cluster administrators running game servers and other similar workloads have a unique set of challenges. Uh, kind of going through these categories, any of these like halt and catch fire events, uh, game over, right? Like that's just the node uh, leaving and that uh, the, any players connected to pods on that node, uh, the game is over. So your mitigations here are things like hardware and software quality, better monitoring. You know, we heard in one of the keynotes around trying to monitor uh, for events better and, and uh, you know, pull nodes out uh, earlier. Um, for things like out of resource evictions, again, your mitigation here is to make sure that these in-state, uh, these workloads that are keeping a lot of uh, state in memory and aren't really capable of checkpointing um, have decent resource management, so good resources, and, uh, good requests and limits, and configure pod priority appropriately, because these are fairly high priority workloads if they can't be evicted. But what about these cluster administrative actions that uh, are around automation? So let's talk about that for a second. 
So why do I care about this? I care <laughs> because as a uh, Google SRE, we would actually love you all to use automation all the time if you could. Uh, it actually helps us as much as it helps you. Um, so the cluster administrative actions largely cover things that would drain the node, uh, either by automation or, you know, as I had you show hands, directly by a cluster administrator. So I've seen a lot of cases where customers just basically disabled most automation on their system. So why do we allow automation at all? In the case of cluster autoscaler, you, you really want uh, to allow cluster autoscaler to scale down your nodes. Uh, and this is especially true, uh, like we came at this looking at game servers, and in the game, uh, for platforms running game servers, uh, it's exceedingly common for, for fleets of game servers to have diurnal cycles where they uh, you know, s spike at night and kind of recede in the middle of the day, depending on the time zones, obviously and especially heavy weekend cycles. You really don't want to be managing that manually. So, uh, you know, for these apps that are hard to disrupt, there's an interesting tension there. Similarly, node upgrade. You want to keep your software up to date. And frankly, if you're not using automation, you're feeding your SREs to the machines. And in the case of repair or auto-scaling, you're probably just leaving uh, hard money on the table. So with that as kind of in mind for why I was looking at this in the first place, how does node drain work in the first, uh, at all? So your automation wants to take a node out of service, or you want to take it out manually. The first thing we do is, uh, the first thing Kubernetes does is waits and tries to honor the pod disruption budget. Um, if there's any uh, pod that where evicting that pod would violate the PDB, uh, you know, it waits for that for, for that period of time. And then it gracefully terminates the pod, honoring what's called the termination grace period seconds. How many of you have configured termination grace period on your pods before? Good. All right. Then maybe we didn't need this talk. <laughs> um, these are both lies, though, depending on your provider and your configuration. So, uh, first is a little bit of an overview of just how termination grace period works. When Kubernetes wants to stop a pod uh, in these voluntary eviction cases, Kubelet will, while waiting termination grace period seconds, run a pre-stop hook, if there's one defined, that lets you kind of do arbitrary behaviors at stop, and then it sends a sig term signal to the application after the pre-stop hook runs. Most people are not using the pre-stop hook, they're just allowing the sig term to come, but I wanted to include that in there. And then after the, the TGPS passes, it'll send a sig kill to the pod uh, if it's still running. So effectively, termination grace period seconds acts as the cleanup period for a pod. It defaults to 30 seconds, so most applications uh, are given a, a you know, decent grace period by kind of stateless web serving uh, standards. Um, most pod evictions offer, <laughs> honor some grace period, which is a really weaselly way of saying it works most of the time. So now that we've actually kind of defined what this termination grace period is, and we were looking at this case study around game servers, we can really uh, kind of def refine our taxonomies a little more and talk about you know, fast yielding apps and slow yielding apps. And what do I mean by that? Uh, anything, I, uh, this is a somewhat arbitrary point, but it's actually related to a, a arbitrary definition, but it's actually related to a cluster autoscaler default. So we can kind of think of fast yielding apps as anything that where the pod can be evicted in less than 10 minutes. Um, that seems like a, a long amount of time, right? Um, and it covers most RPC servers uh, and HTTP servers, and it covers most stateful workloads. And I might get a little bit of a challenge on that, but it's most stateful workloads that are uh, 
you know, keeping themselves, uh, or sorry, maintaining their state on disk, your databases, et cetera, can typically checkpoint in this amount of time, uh, usually much less. Then we get into these like slow yielding apps, which is basically everything else. Any workload where losing the end memory state is costly uh, in you know, hard money, like your training workloads, in reputation, like game servers. So session servers, uh, again, is we actually use to run other things, like uh, we, had, we have an internal customer using it to run voice chat. Uh, we have another one that's using it for live video transcoding. Um, so for example, if, if this were streamed uh, you know, live through Google Cloud, uh, that's actually running through a similar mechanic as a game server. Um, many of the AI training jobs have this attribute, too, of being fairly slow yielding, and kind of the HPC-ish batch jobs as well. So now that we've talked about this notion of kind of uh, splitting our workloads up into the slow yielding and fast yielding camps, let's talk about why actually allowing automation is a challenge. The first is the cloud providers, and I'm sorry because I was part of this, did not make it easy for you. Um, we all chose different mechanics for things like upgrades. Uh, at, at Google, GKE on a standard surge upgrade will uh, basically just disrupt your pod if the uh, combination of the PDB plus termination grace period uh, lasts more than an hour. On, uh, so we chose that the upgrade operation itself uh, has priority. Uh, on AKS and EKS, they both fail the upgrade operation after uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, those are both configurable. And so they chose that the upgrade operation should uh, kind of the more, more toil towards the uh, whoever is maintaining the upgrade in the first place. Um, one advice here is a depending on your provider, you might just be able to bump the upgrade operation, uh, like timeouts associated with disruption, and then b uh, a lot of the cloud providers are actually starting to provide automated blue green upgrades where they you know, scale down one node pool while another, uh, uh, scale down one set of nodes while the other set of nodes uh, scales up. Uh, with a different set of choices is the autoscalers. Cluster autoscaler and Carpenter uh, both honor the PDB. They both uh, honor the, the termination grace period seconds to a point. Um, how many of you knew that uh, Cluster Autoscaler will actually just terminate your pod after 10 minutes by default? All right, few hands. <laughs> um, so this might be a surprise to you. Uh, so it, you get no warning, no status, no annotation on the pod, anything. Cluster Autoscaler, if you do not change its defaults, will just disrupt your pod regardless of what you set your termination grace period seconds to. Uh, Carpenter actually uses a configurable per node pool uh, maximum. And in both of them, you do have a concern because like scale down has some bandwidth associated with it too. Like obviously if these uh, workloads yield slowly, you're gonna have um, uh, nodes are kind of slow to, to be drained. Uh, and they both have like a magic annotation where you can say, don't evict me ever. So now that we've seen this, we have a, a few kind of best practices you can use for these slower yielding apps. Uh, you can ensure that your app, first off, is ensure that your app uh, supports SIG term in some way. If you want to support automation, you need to be cooperative with the uh, eviction system as it stands. You can for like legacy apps or some other reason, use a pre-stop hook to block SIG term, uh, but it's a little bit tricky. Tune the termination grace period seconds in, your, in the pod specification. 
to the maximum termination grace period seconds for your autoscaler. So Cluster Autoscaler and Carpenter both support ways to tune that. Uh, tune your upgrade or look into automated uh, blue-green upgrades. So if you have a, an hour-long workload, you may need to tune that as well. Um, and a kind of advanced case, but if you know what your cycles look like, uh, you can also try to find slower yielding apps to the same nodes. Typically, you want them all to kind of terminate near the same time, too. That is a longer conversation, but it's definitely something you can uh, tinker with if you're interested. In Agonias, we actually tried to build an eviction API to make this a little easier. This is a little bit of a, an eyesore, but uh, the idea was we have a little tag that says it's always safe to evict or it's never safe to evict. Um, this translated into, a, the goal was to translate a declared evictableness into appropriate policies for a given environment. Uh, I did this when GKA Autopilot didn't yet support the safe to evict equals false flag, so there was a few other machinations we needed to do. Basically, I wanted a way for people to be able to translate uh, Agone's game server specifications and have them kind of work portably between at least GKA standard and autopilot with hooks available for other clouds. But that's Agone's. Honestly, uh, if you were interested in uh, doing this on your own workloads, you could probably do something similar with just a straight policy agent or a custom webhook to enforce policies that are appropriate for your work workloads. Uh, in particular, if your workloads all support SIG terms, so they're like, you know, uh, let's call them digital native apps or modern apps, right, uh, that know that SIG term means I need to clean up now, you could probably just use the termination grace period seconds as an indicator and say, you know, if TGPS is this, then I need to follow this set of steps. And similarly, you know, you can also then ensure that they, those workloads are scheduled onto node pools or clusters where that, uh, where the cluster autoscaler and upgrades are appropriately scheduled, are appropriately configured. Um, so a lot of this is kind of just a, you know, you can make this a little bit magical on your own uh, just by looking at the termination grace period seconds. And it's kind of a disservice that the cluster autoscaler actually just kind of violates it willy-nilly. Um, but, you know, that's an example of a way to kind of get around it. Um, and, and, and to make your workloads portable in case you, for instance, want to test out both cluster autoscaler and Carpenter or you're porting between different clouds and you're running different things on each one, et cetera. So the two biggest things you need to consider if you wanted to implement something like what Agones does is does the app do the right thing with SIG term? Otherwise, you're going to have to do something different. And how long does it take after SIG term before it's safe to terminate, which is the TGPS uh, conversation. So takeaways. Pod disruption in Kubernetes is a series of trade-offs. It's a multivariate problem of cost, human toil, complexity of the application, et cetera. Think about the cost of disruption. Dis uh, disruption is not a binary thing of this app can be disrupted or not. Disruption is uh, a cost associated with what is the cost of disrupting this particular pod and engineer appropriately. So for application owners, um, think about can you introduce some sort of checkpointing or is it too expensive and complexity of resources? So if you do have an application like a game server, you know, how do you convince the game developer to allow some sort of checkpointing, uh, introduce, you know, uh, uh, during cutscenes, we reconnect to the clients, stuff like that, right? For app owners and administrators, with fast yielding apps, make sure to tune your PDBs, consider things like topology, et cetera. Uh, with slower yielding apps, also make sure to tune your, your termination grace period seconds and tune your automation appropriately. And with that, I am going to take some questions. Um, and just before I do,
Uh, I will be at the Google booth from like 4 to 6 p.m. today. If you have any questions you just want to chat with me about, too. So. All right. Uh, hello. I have a question. Um, so famously, a lot of the workload operators, like you know, rep replica set, stateful set, they don't use the pod eviction API. They just go ahead and uh, delete the pod. And uh, I assume, you know, similarly, humans can fat finger and delete pods. Controller can delete pods for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I think the Agonis case is very interesting because the pod is essentially stateful, right? You don't want to disconnect people from the game server. Um, I wonder, has there any um, interest in SIG apps or any other uh, interest groups before to look into? to maybe some sort of external um, system to consult to before allowing a pod to be evicted or deleted in the first place? That's a super interesting question. So the, the question was, is there a notion of like a central uh, disruption controller uh, to ask, can this pod be evicted right now, or disrupted right now? Uh, I don't know of an effort like that. I'd be actually super interested in it. Um, but. Uh, that is actually how some like Google systems are arranged, for instance, is instead of like trying to federate disruption outward, we try to like kind of centralize it in and say, can this thing be disrupted so we can make like central decisions around this? Um, and it, I think it's uh, something worth considering. Uh, cool. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you all. <laughs>